calling you lovable How are you feeling now? Making it out of the boat Falling for you somehow Good morning. Come on in if you're out in the foyer. Why don't we stand? Good to have you at our 1030 service here at Pathway. My name's Alan. If any of you are new, uh, checking us out, glad that you're here today. I hope you enjoy your experience. We open our services in a particular fashion. We pray for other communities of faith around the great state of Maine. Uh, today we are praying for Litchfield Plains Baptist Church. Let's pray. Lord, what I, I love about the, just the Im imagery of this picture is the, it's an iconic, you know, classic New England historical church, Lord. But uh, more importantly than the building itself, what, what buildings like that represent is the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of human beings to invite people into relationship with you. So we're thankful, Lord, whatever, whatever context of their gatherings and existence are today we pray you would meet them in a profound way providing all that they need to be attentive and to have influence amongst those they have influence among so bless them lord we pray for this church as they name the name of jesus same as with us keep them inspired to the truth of scripture and the infilling of your holy spirit bless them lord and we thank you lord to gather today uh father this is our offering of worship this morning we pray that you would meet us Holy Spirit, we know you're here, so we say make us aware of your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Say hi to the person beside you or near you, and let's worship.
So can we just say that again?
his arms around you and remind you how much he loves you. So whoever that's for, today's the day. Stop running. God loves you just the way you are. You don't have to change. So come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Touch that person right now. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that it just come into a church service this morning. Lives can be changed. You are here. You love us. And we love you. So we're open to what you want to do today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And at the end of the service, we're going to have people come up and pray for, it, for anybody with anything. And if that's you, maybe something I just said, something that happened during worship, come up and get prayer today. Don't be afraid to do that. Uh, so my name is Seth, and I'm one of the pastors here, and this morning I want to draw your attention to the bulletins real quick. Uh, you might not have noticed, but we have a new one for the month of February. It's in the seat back. It's also at all of the doors. Maybe a greeter gave one to you, but it has all the events coming up in the month of February. And I just want to take a quick note to, to point out that next Sunday the, is the top one, the Chili Cook-Off in Jersey Sunday. And if you've been thinking about wanting to make chili, but you haven't signed up for it yet, and it's just been on your mind, well, today's a great day to do that. And so a lot of times we use the Church Center app. Today we want to go old school. We want to use these. So if that's something that you want to do, you want to be a part of that great event next Sunday, just take a second, put your name on it, right on the back, chili. And we'll know what that means. And uh, we'll get in contact with you this week. And so if you want to do that, do it right now. And then we have a couple guys uh, and ladies in the back who will come up and get that if you have your hands up. All right? Uh, this morning, if you came, you've got a tithe, you've got an offering for the Lord. You want to, to do that, you can do that on your way out. There's boxes at every exit. You can go online through the, to uh, our website, pathwayvineyard.com, or the Church Center app. Uh, lots of different ways to give. And so let me just pray a blessing over that. God, thank you. Thank you for, for everything. And includes, including uh, all that's going to be given today. Lord, would you bless everyone here? Would you bless all that's given, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, please uh, take a second, fill those out if you want. And now check out the announcements. See what's coming up next. Hey, hey! Welcome to Pathway. We're glad you're here. My name is Malik. I'm on staff here at Pathway. And if you are new, we would love to connect with you. If you're tech savvy, you can scan the QR code with your smartphone, fill the connect card out right from your phone and see if you prefer paper pen and people, we have a new and improved connect card just for you. Where you can see the upcoming events like if gathering, sign up for prayer requests, all while staying connected to other campus and locations. You can find these cards in the chair back or information booth. Regardless, however you fill it out, come to the info booth for every newcomer gets a gift just to say thank you for checking us out today. Church Chili Cook-Off in Jersey contest is going down Super Bowl Sunday. Please, if you got some good chili, sign up to make your good chili because I need to taste good chili or wear your favorite Team Jersey. I know, the Pistons stink too. Okay, but don't worry, it doesn't have to be just football jersey. It can be basketball, as you see. The chili with the most votes gets bragging rights and their name on the illustrious chili cook-off trophy. Donations will be given to 
to our youth group program. Please sign up today and see you there. Baptisms, we will be celebrating with those who made an important decision to be baptized. If you're considering baptism, we encourage you to sign up for baptism class. See the info booth after service for more info. Team Winter Retreat. The Winter Retreat is back. Set your smartphone, your calendar for the February school vacation break with hundreds of students from Vineyard East region. We will be worshiping, listening to sound teaching, fellowshipping together at Camp Lador in Pennsylvania. There will also be a ton of activities, games, and of course, food. Registration will close soon, February 9th. Seats are limited, so sign up today after church or use the Church Center app. See you there. Night of Worship and Ministry. Join us February 23rd, 7 p.m. to 9 for a night of worship and ministry. We will gather for a night of worship and ministry with our spiritual community. For everything that is in me blesses his name. Child care will be provided. See you there. And for our final segment, hmm, did you know making eye contact with your neighbor and saying good morning gives your neighbor a natural and genuine thought of having a good morning, especially when the morning didn't start off so good. So if you would please stand, turn to the person next to you and say good morning. As always, we hope you feel loved and welcome here at Path. Good, why don't we settle back in? Yeah, so next, next Sunday is just one of those Sundays to have uh, fun with. I know many of you will be watching the game and in preparation of the game. We always thought it's a great day to do our chili cook-off. Uh, there's a prestigious trophy you get if you win the chili cook-off. So that's one incentive to... Uh, to participate and uh, come with your, you know, taste testing taste buds on next week. And uh, it's actually a popular, uh, you know, a fan vote or congregation vote that picks the favorite chili. Uh, and then, guys, seriously, uh, dig out your favorite sports jersey. It can be basketball, football, hockey, soccer, uh, you know, not if you're on the swim team, not that. But every, just about everything else goes, and it is a contest. There'll be prizes for whosoever uh, uh, kind of outfit captures the, the most attention. Uh, what I'm going to be looking for uh, next week, because I'm one of the judges, as all of you are, I'm wondering how many of you can squeeze into your old Letterman jacket. Uh, that'd be a good thing to bring, like to wear. Like I weighed 138 pounds when I graduated high school, so... I have to cut mine up to get into it, but I'd be interested to see if any of you could get into yours. But yeah, and just a fun Sunday next week, so leading up to the big game. Uh, verse thir- uh, we're going to look at 13 verses in the book of John today. We're still in chapter 1, just starting this series. I hope you're reading along. The real challenge in all this is uh, John writes in such a way that, as we said, it can be uh, very introductory for those that are exploring the truths of Christianity, but there's deep, deep, profound, profound theological thought in all of these verses as well. So part of my challenge is just trying to uh, really be attentive to what the Holy Spirit saying that he wants to say through me to us in terms of these passages in a life applicable way. I don't know about you, but when I go to church, I, I you know, hear a pastor speak, I'm hoping to hear something 
that I can really put into effect when Monday morning rolls around, right? I mean, that's, that for me was always the goal of, uh, that I appreciated if somebody could draw that out of Scripture. So I hope to do that for you today. We'll again look at the first 13 verses. I think there's a few nuggets that uh, God wants us to focus on here. First, just in a review of what we looked at last week, let me just remind us, uh, read again the first five verses. Again, John is the apostle. He's writing these words. He uses interesting language to introduce Jesus coming on the scene. He says it this way in John 1.1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Just a number of different ways we could go just with those first five verses. But again, we said that John was very particular about the words that he used, referring to Jesus rather than a name, referring to him as the Word, capital W. And we said what he was doing there, he was, he was making an inextricable link between Jesus, the one who has arrived, the one who stands before you, is actually the one who spoke with the word things into existence. So Jesus and God, they're one. He's with God, he is God, he's in the beginning, he's here. Came with a very specific mission to bring light into the darkness of the world. To eradicate sin from the world. That's what John's saying in all of this opening. Jesus is God and he's come to do for humanity what humanity can't do for ourselves and that's fix the sin condition in the world. That's all packed into those first five verses. Now to the Jewish mind, the Jewish audience as they're listening, being familiar with the Torah in the ancient text, John is hoping they'd make that link. The Messiah that they had long awaited for has arrived. As we'll see today, we know that many that, uh, of the Jewish audience rejected Jesus being the Savior. We'll explore that theme a few times through this book of the Bible. And to the Gentile mind, well, by this time, humans had become very familiar with the fact that darkness, brokenness had permeated creation. You don't have to go far, you don't have to, go far to find broken parts of humanity. And John's desire in writing this letter is they might understand that light has come to illuminate the darkness, not only illuminate the darkness, but eradicate the darkness from this planet. And that was John's desire in writing this letter, that all these things be communicated with. Today we'll look at verses 6 through 13 and find a few nuggets in there uh, in terms of what's going on. Verse 6 opens this way, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Let's just park there for a minute. Now, this John is not writing about himself here. The author John, the Apostle John, is now writing about John the Baptist, who is a different John. And John the Baptist had a very specific assi assignment. He would come and be a voice uh, speaking of the one who has come, the Savior. Now, it's important that you understand that uh, this role that John the Baptist played was a pretty important role. Because although John's life had been predicted, some 700 years before John the Baptist's arrival, Isaiah had prophesied that he would come and prepare the way for the Lord. A lot of time has transpired since that happened. And actually, there's an interesting time in, in history called the intertestamental time. It's the time between the concluding events of the Old Testament and the beginning events of the New Testament and the arrival of Jesus. Up until the arrival of Jesus, the way that God primarily communicated with humans was through the prophetic voice, through prophets. Think Elijah, think uh, Ezekiel, think Jeremiah, think Isaiah. God would speak through the prophet his heart and they would communicate it to the people. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, was the last historical prophet that God spoke to the masses through until John the Baptist arrived. In between Malachi and John the Baptist, 430 years. There's no recorded history of God speaking to humanity for a 430-year period. We're going to look at God's timing in a few minutes. 
how we wrestle with that, if I can talk. <clears throat> Sign up for chili. to think that I'm encountering God right now, but I choked on my own spit. <clears throat> All right, it's coming back. So 430 years between Malachi <clears throat> and John the Baptist. I'd take like a cough drop or something or someone that one. So we're going to look at God's timing because we, if you're like me, we wrestle with that. God, you promised. Why is it taking so long? God, you said. Why is it not coming to pass? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. So now, so now I have the awkward chewing on this and talking to you. And, uh, but before we get to looking at God's timing, I want to talk a little bit about John the Baptist because interesting verse 6. John the Apostle says, there was a man sent from God and his name was John. Think of all the ways that God could have announced his arrival. He chose John. You know, this, this guy who had been prophesied about 700 years before his arrival. Remember the story of Elizabeth? John the Baptist is actually Jesus' cousin, although most scholars say they probably didn't know each other as adults. But Elizabeth, it's prophesied she'd have a baby, and she has a baby. It's John the Baptist, and, and uh, you know, John comes on the scene. And then John lives a life of obscurity. He literally goes out into the desert, he takes a Levitical oath, he separates himself from kind of society. He really becomes kind of a weird guy in the community. You know, the Bible describes him as wearing like camel hair and his hair is all wild and he eats locusts. Like, not, not necessarily probably the most popular guy in the crowd. And yet, the savior of the planet is announced through John. I love that God put that verse in the Bible, verse 6. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. Because that reminds me that God includes us in his work. He includes us in his activity. You know, the little obscure John God used to announce the coming of a Messiah. How might God use you? See, my mentor told me, hey, he goes, you don't necessarily have to cross John's name out. But he said, write your name over the top in that passage. So in my Bible, my analog Bible I have at home, it says, there was a man sent from God, and his name is Alan. Put your name in there. Why wouldn't God desire to use you for his purposes in the 21st century? Like, John the Baptist isn't coming back. We're the people of God of the 21st century. And God still desires to work through the people of this planet, communicating his heart for other people, for lost people. All right? So I look at Matt, and I say, Matt writes in his Bible, there's a man sent from God, and his name is Matt. Like, you, God formed you in your mother's womb. He knit you together. He did so with purpose and intent in mind. It wasn't just so you took up space. Now, we don't always cooperate with God's plan. But when we do, when we take a step towards him, as Seth said, when we stop running and we turn around and we smack into him because he never left us, he's right there, we begin to realize that our life has value. It has purpose. 
And if God could use John, why not you? I mean, think of all the ways that God could have announced the sending of his son, Jesus, to save the world. 100,000 angels. The heavens could have opened up and 100,000 angels descended and sung the praises of Christ. It didn't happen. God, not limited by time or space or anything. I mean, he could have shown up on a modern-day spaceship. That would have caught ancient world's attention. Could have, a volcano could have erupted and Jesus comes surfing down the lava field. People would have said, that's unusual. No, he, he used John. Weird guy out in the desert. Dressed in camo hair. I mean, I don't know about you, but I look at that and I think, well, maybe God will use me. Because I know my life at times has felt obscure, like not all that particularly important. Oh, it is. Your life's important. And your assignment might not be the same as John's. Your assignment might be a stay-at-home parent taking care of a special need child. But you do it with the belief that God purposed you. And that nobody could do better than you what it is that God has invited you to do. And that's why he gave it you that assignment. Whatever your name is. I mean, Josh or... Amanda or Kathy or sent by God, invited in to the kingdom of God, the activity of the kingdom. I mean, I think the Christian journey sounds a lot more interesting when we think, like, God wants to use me? Of course he does. Absolutely he does. Your life has both value and meaning to God. Do not compare your assignment to John or anyone else for that matter. But I invite you to live with confident assurance that you matter to God. And if God can have your yes, your life has incredible meaning. I think everybody's looking for meaning, whether they know how to articulate it or not. But the heart of every human at some point asks, why am I here? And, you know, the, if you ever wonder, like, well, I wonder what our purpose could be here in the 21st century. I think it's to help a hurting world understand. As John said, the light came into the darkness. The light was not overcome by the darkness. Like, there's hope. There's freedom. And there's a lot of people that just don't understand that they're here on purpose for a purpose. You know, Tim Keller would always say to uh, anybody that was maybe uh, atheist thinking in the audience, and he would say to them, you know, if, if you really believe that you arrived from nothingless, thus making your entry into the world insignificant, and if you really believe that when you die, you just deteriorate into dust so your death has no significance well the sad fact is that means that while you're living you're insignificant where's the hope in that the truth of the matter is is you have great significance there was a man sent from heaven and his name was Adam his name was Jeff her name was Rachel. Her name was Diane. And the God of heaven is just wooing you and saying, come be part of what I'm doing. I have so much more to offer you than what this world is offering. There's a man sent from heaven. His name was John. He came with a fascinating assignment. As I was reading this text, though, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what? Well, this thing, there's so much deep theological thought in here about the light and the darkness. And we'll get, uh, good thing about John is he weaves these themes throughout his writing. So if we don't necessarily maybe touch on the part that really piques your interest in, in some of these teachings, we'll, we'll circle back around and get to these passages. But just so you kind of understand the way my, my mind works, um, as I was thinking about John the Baptist, thinking about the arrival of Jesus, uh, 
one of the things that I began to just do a deep dive in in my study was God's timing. Have you ever been like me and think, God, why did you wait so long? Like 4,000 years or so between the fall and Jesus coming to fix what humans broke. I mean, if we believe Genesis 3.15 to be the original gospel, the original prophetic word of God saying, I'm going to fix what humanity broke, think about that. Immediately after the fall, Genesis 3.15, God says this to Adam and Eve and to the serpent, the deceiver. Genesis 3.15 says, and I, God, will put enmity or I will cause trouble between you and the woman, says this to the serpent, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So in a sense, it's as if though God says to the enemy of humankind, you'll have an effect. You'll hurt my creation, but ultimately you'll be defeated. The crushing of the head of the serpent. Revelation paints this picture where evil is eradicated because of the work of Jesus Christ. God makes this proclamation to humankind right after they broke creation. And then some 4,000 years later, John the Baptist comes on the scene. Do you ever wrestle with God's timing? I mean, I do. Why the wait? John the Baptist is prophesied about by Isaiah 700 years before he arrives. Why the wait? So I ask myself that, why the wait? Do you want to know the answer? Yeah, I do too. I don't know. You know, when, when people say, well, Alan, God's timing isn't our timing, that doesn't always help. Even though it's true. M- maybe we wouldn't have existed if God hadn't awaited. I, I don't know. But I do know this. If God sets something in motion and then says, wait, the wait has purpose and ultimately would be worth it. I think one of the sad commentaries we read in the passage today is John said that the light came and he came amongst his own and some rejected him. And we'll see that theme throughout John. They, they, they despised the wait. They gave up waiting. The very people that said, we're waiting for a Messiah, we're waiting for a Messiah, we're waiting for a Messiah. John the Baptist comes on the scene, the scene and says, here's the Messiah. No, 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 no that's, that's, not, that's not what we were expecting. They got, unfortunately got lost in the wait. I, I'd say if God has you in a place of waiting, the wait will be worth it. We're familiar with that saying, right, worth the wait. But how many of us are actually good at waiting? My buddy this week, I was having a conversation with him about, about this. I just mentioned, now I'm going to talk a little bit about waiting. He said, yeah, he goes, lots of times we spell wait, W-E-I-G-H-T, meaning waiting, waiting is burdensome for us. You know, just think through your own journey. How, how good of a waiter are you? I mean, wait three minutes in the drive up and we begin to question the competency of the kid that took our order. What's wrong with this person? We binge watch TV series forgetting that if you're my age, we had to wait a week between episodes. Don't even get me started about the time it takes to board a plane and that plane actually moving towards the runway. Consider pregnancy. Can you imagine not having that nine-month wait It was just like getting a puppy. Hey, you want to stop at the baby place on the way home? (laughs) Not that we're ever ready for a baby, right? But thank God for the wait. (laughs) Waiting can prove useful. Waiting often means that things are having to happen in order for the desired outcome to come to fruition. See, God knows better than us what has to happen through his timeline as he sees history, in order for the desired outcome. What's God's desired outcome? That the maximum amount of humanity goes to heaven and lives eternally with him. And he knows perfectly how long the wait needs to be in order for that best desired outcome to come to fruition. Don't despise the wait. 
John the Baptist, I mean, this is a pretty kind of somber lesson to be learned in just John the Baptist's life. He gets prophesied about by Isaiah 700 years before his arrival, about by Malachi 400 years before his arrival, finally comes on the scene, man sent from heaven, from God, his name is John, he's on the scene, he has to go live in the desert for 30 years waiting for his assignment. And then John the Baptist's assignment day comes, it doesn't end well for John. As we'll see, he had a very brief moment on the earth after the wait. Don't despise the wait. It's often in the waiting that God is doing his work of preparation, formation, and transformation. And when we begin to outpace God because we're frustrated with the wait, it's when we usually compound our brokenness. Because we don't like to wait. We like to be in control. I, I would just encourage you, maybe, John, as we read through it, and you think through things like timing, we'll begin to develop a habit where we really allow ourselves to trust God's timing. And so our prayers maybe begin to shift a little bit from frustration of waiting to saying, Lord, may I discover what it is that you want to do in me in the midst of this wait. It begins to change the way we, we look at waiting. John the Baptist has an uh, interesting journey, as we'll see, as we, we press into his thoughts here. Again, he makes a very declarative statement. What I don't want to get lost in all of John's writing here in these first 13 verses is the gospel, the good news gospel is woven through it. Like with all the kind of rabbit trails we can go down with, you know, us being created on purpose, for a purpose, and the process of waiting, what John has made very, 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 very clear is Jesus primarily came to do what? Help us gain access to God, our creator. That the light came to overcome the darkness. I, I love the way he concludes it. He says, verse 12, after he spoke of he came amongst his own, but his own did not receive him. In verse 12 it says, Yet, for all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave, he is giving the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. I love the way John just kind of, because he's talking again to a, a, a Jewish audience who, I mean, you know, at times the, the, the people of God, the Israelites, they, they got a little bit exclusive with who the good news was for. You know, which is natural. Like all of us, if we're given an assignment, we begin to, you know, develop that attitude like, well, this is my, you see the assignment God gave me? My, not your assignment, my assignment. I don't know why we do that to each other. But the, 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 the Jews had, had been given an assignment and this assignment was coming to fruition they reject Jesus, and Jesus just says, guys, it wasn't just for you that I came either. Because there were those that would begin to misuse the gospel, and he says, for all who did receive him. John is helping us understand that who's the good news of Jesus Christ for? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. No matter background, heritage, ethnicity, place of birth, it's for whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And as you call on the name of Jesus, what do you receive in turn? Your heritage has changed. Instead of being separated from God, you're, you're, you're enveloped into the arms of God as a child of God for all eternity. Again, John said in chapter 20, if you remember when we looked at it last week, that's why I wrote these words, to help people understand. Jesus came, for a very specific reason, to fix what we could not fix for ourselves, that is what separated us from God, our sin condition. Jesus fixed it for us by dying in our place, raising to be with the Father. So all that we have to do by the grace of God is simply say, God, I'll take what you're offering. I want to be removed from the dark places of this world and walk in the light 
that you are inviting me into. And John's saying, all you got to do for that is say yes to what Jesus is offering. And maybe that's the nugget for you today. Why don't we stand? Why don't we do this? I, I think, you know, Seth had a pretty uh, strong word from the Lord in terms of some of you that maybe have been trying to outpace God along life's journey. I, I love that imagery of, because sometimes we go so far off the rails, we think, man, yeah, that God thing sounds great, but I'd have to go on such a quest to find him because of how far I've gone. I love that imagery of no matter how far you think you've gone from God, turn around. And you're going to smack right into him. Because he's never abandoned you. He's never strayed from you. He certainly might not like some of the places we try to drag him into. But he's a God who does not give up pursuing you. Not just because he has this amazing tenacity to not give up. Because he created you knows you by name, wove you together in your mother's womb, intricately forming you, giving you the heritage that you have, the skin tone that you have, the hair or lack of that you have. Because he loves you. That's why you're here. Because the God who spoke everything into existence, so I, I love that one. I love that one. I love that one. He never gets sick of saying it. Some of you have run. Today is your day to stop. Let's close our eyes. Let's really take a private moment here. If you want to stop running today, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm just trying to Mark this day, February 4th, 2024 for you. If you want to stop running today, just raise your hand up for a minute. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Awesome. Hands around the room. Now, just, you can put your hand down. Just say this prayer to God in the quietness of your own thoughts. Jesus, here I am. This day in February... 2024 I'm stopping the running I say yes to you Jesus I say yes to forgiveness I say yes to a new life I say yes to a relationship with my creator God I surrender my life to you today May I begin to understand the love you have for me and the purpose you created me for. I say yes to you today, Jesus. For those of you that have prayed that, I'd like a prayer team to come forward. I would just invite you, if you had the courage before you left to come say hi to one of our friends down front, we would just love to pray for you. Like, to just get you kind of kick-started on this journey. I can understand the thought of that which might seem overwhelming to some of you, but the, the neat thing about doing uh, kind of foolish things in front of Christians is Christians have already done those foolish things, so they don't seem quite so foolish to us. And so we, if you said yes to Jesus today before you run out of here, I'd love for you to maybe to come say hi to one of these guys when I dismiss. Just let us know your name and maybe say, we'll pray for you. We'll help you now walk this journey that we have to walk by faith. I'd say if you're wrestling with God's timing in any situation and circumstance and you just want God to meet you in that, when I dismiss, come get some prayer for that. It doesn't cost you anything and God may just change the disposition of your heart. God may even change the circumstances. Like why not ask, like I just not, when you hear me talk about not getting frustrated with God's timing, that doesn't mean we don't have particular permission to ask that God's timing would change or, or that his the situation would change that the timing would actually be like okay now that's done 
We can pray for that. We can ask for that. Ultimately, we just don't want to be undone when things don't happen the way exactly we want them to. Or if you feel like you've lacked purpose, maybe you felt you've lived in obscurity, maybe, maybe you're saying, I can't, I don't believe God has purpose for me. We'd like to pray for that over you. Because I believe it for you with all my heart. And that's one thing I love about our Christian faith is sometimes we have to lean on the people that believe things for us when we have a hard time believing them for ourselves. That's the beauty of Christian community. Like I believe things for you sometimes more passionately than I believe them for myself. That's just the way we do this. Let me, let me close us in prayer. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here in our midst today. God, for those that perhaps have felt like they were running and they took a, just a posture of surrender today. So I'm tired of running. Lord, I pray that they not leave here feeling like, oh, I just made an emotional response. I pray you would really, really, really capture their life in such a way that today becomes the first day of the rest of their eternity. That they can mark this day, February 4th, 2024, I met the God of creation. Do that for them, Lord. Show them the love you have for them. And just as a church, show us how we can come alongside and help. Lord, I pray that not a listener to my voice would feel insignificant in this world. There's a man, there's a woman sent by God, and they stand before me, Lord. Let each of us believe that. And God, when it comes to life's timing... God, I pray you'd give us a ruthless trust that if you've said it, you'll set it in motion. May we meet you in the moments in between. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Come get some prayer if you'd like. Bring some chili. Bring a jersey next week. We'll see you on the journey.